You know what I got told today? I got told that in this coat, I actually somehow look like Jerry Kramer. And, you know, first of all, um, I don't see it. Second, he is a delight. So thank you. But third, I best not look that old yet. Really. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lombardi Time Bruiser. I'm your host, John Delray. Today, we are taking a look at free agents, the thin pickings that there is of the free agent market at this time as we stand now just about 20 days away from the NFL draft. And I really wanted to look at this for a couple reasons, right? While not done every single year or even most of Brian Gutekind's tenure, he has before signed April free agents to plug a couple holes. So it's not completely out of bounds. Also, some of these guys could also be just post-draft signings, assuming they don't get signed anywhere else, to fill in spots that maybe don't get filled through the draft. So I'm going to focus on the Packers' biggest positions of need, and they are offensive tackle, interior offensive line, trend there, safety, and then linebacker. So I do want to cover two kind of quick topics before we get into this. And I did mention that Brian Gutekunst has signed guys in April before. Okay. So I want to give a little history here. After being hired in January of 2018, over the course of his six previous draft off seasons, Brian Gutekunst has made these types of signings twice, three different players, two different seasons. The first being Devin Funches, who signed his contract on April 2nd of 2020 as the Packers were looking to shore up their wide receiver position. The other two occurred in 2022. Keyshawn Nixon, who was signed at the very end of March, March 26th, 2022. And then also the happy memories associated with this one, Sammy Watkins, who signed on April 14th of 2022. The other thing that I just wanted to touch base on real quick before we get to the players that may be good fits for the Packers happens to be the Packers' financial situation. They're comfortable, but they're not completely flush monetarily either. Over the cap has them at about $21 million in available cap space right now. Figure about 10 of that-ish go to the draft. And you're left with roughly $10 million, give or take a couple here or there, for free agency operating room in the season, et cetera, et cetera. Plus, not to mention, a certain franchise quarterback contract is looming potentially as soon as the second week of May. So, without anything else, I'm going to be covering two to three free agents, one for one position, for every single one of these positions of need. And I'm going to say something else here, too. It's April, okay? These are not perfect players in their prime. So while there may be varying opinions about whether these players would be good matches, whether they're a great player or not, keep in mind that the vast majority of these guys are available in April for a reason, be it a bad season last year or a couple. Injuries, age, monetary demands at this juncture. Okay, we all get it that these guys are not yet signed for some reason. So, with the understanding that all of these are imperfect players, let's take a look at who may be a fit for the Green Bay Packers. Spot number one, I'm going to cover first, offensive tackle. Look, we know that the Packers may be looking at offensive tackle in this draft. They've brought in uh, Mims, Guyton for top 30 visits, as they're called. And while I have made it known that I don't personally support a tackle being drafted in round one for various reasons, unless they can also start at right guard. But depth here is an unquestioned area of need, with Luke Tenuta and Caleb Jones being the next man up if there's any kind of injury to Rashid Walker or Zach Tom. And tackle has been a place where they've been willing to bring in a vet swing tackle before. Think Dennis Kelly, Mickey Wagner. So the first player that I'd consider here, if he'd be willing to entertain a swing tackle role, would be Charles Leno Jr. 33 years old. 
coming off off-season hip surgery took place not too long ago, cost him that hip. There's been a lot of stuff building up. I actually looked at a podcast that he was on recently where he spoke, said that the hip had just kind of been building to being a bigger problem thing as he's been aging, cost him four games last year, got a surgery to clean it up, but still nonetheless off-season surgery relatively recently. He was released by Washington this last offseason to free up over $7 million in cap space for Washington. And there are viable questions about whether he wants to continue playing or not. In that podcast, he detailed the fact that he had just enjoyed a lovely night at home making slime with his family. So in order for him to want to continue playing, which may be a little bit of a red flag to some out there, it has to be the right situation, the right circumstances for Leno. But if the Packers can get him, they'd be getting a guy with a world of starting experience and a pretty strong year as recently as last year. And in spite of missing four games last year, he's been shockingly durable throughout the course of his career. With the exception of his rookie year, Leno Jr. has logged at least 880 snaps in every season since 2015. And he is a little bit more of a pass blocker. This last season, he had a pass blocking efficiency rating of 96.9. Much like his durability, he hasn't had a season under 96 since 2016. Last year, he gave up three sacks, five quarterback hits while playing for the Commanders. Cost is a question, as is, would he accept a spot as a swing tackle? Has he given up on being a starter? Are the opportunities just not there league-wide? So that is something to certainly be answered. But we also know teams are a little bit more willing to spend on swing tackle in recent years. The Packers may find themselves in that spot. If he decides to keep playing rather than staying at home with family, if he wants to come play for a contender, the Packers could make a wise move in securing a rather questionable spot on the roster while also continuing to coach up, mentor, whatever, what have you. Any rookie that they bring in or Caleb Jones, if they continue developing him, Luke Tenuta, same thing. Of a relevant note, the man has played 9,330 snaps in his career. 9,249 of them have taken place at left tackle. The man is a left tackle. He's very rarely hopped over to the other side. In fact, the main bulk of his snaps that haven't come at left tackle have actually been as an inline tight end. So an injury to Zach Tom would realistically click Rashid Walker over to right tackle so Leno could play left. So not a true swing tackle in that regard. But Brian Gutekunst also has mentioned that he's comfortable with Rasheed Walker playing on either side of the line. The other offensive tackle that I'd at least think is worth a look would be Cam Fleming, formerly of the Denver Broncos. The 10-year vet should be incredibly used to the swing tackle role, having filled that role with three different teams over his career with a couple years mixed in as a starter. Having played the last three years in Denver on a series of one-year contracts, Fleming, who turns 32 in September, would at the very least provide a vet presence, much like Leno. Certainly a significantly more cost-effective option as well, Fleming logged 75 pass-blocking snaps at the Broncos last year, and while he did not allow a single sack and gave up only three pressures. The year prior, he was forced into significantly larger work for Denver, and it had pretty varied results, I'm not going to lie. 2022, he played 976 snaps, and in a testament to his swing tackleness, 603 of them were on the right, 373 on the left. In that 2022 season, he gave up a not terrific seven sacks over 565 pass-blocking snaps. He did earn a 72.6 overall grade from PFF. Is he a perfect player? No, he's not. But if they're looking for someone in the mold of a Dennis Kelly, of a Ricky Wagner, just a vet to come be a part of the swing tackle experience, they could do a lot worse than Cam Fleming, especially given his versatility side to side. Moving on to the interior of the offensive line. I've not exactly been quiet over my time here on this podcast in the last two years, but the Packers need to upgrade over Royce Newman. And right now, today, I can't decide if that's more true than ever or less true than ever. And there's a reason for each. The reason that it's more true than ever is the guy is suddenly expensive. With a cap hit over $3 million, he's actually their fifth highest cap charge on offense. 
The reason it's less true than ever, though, he's the only backup interior offensive lineman on the team currently. Yeah, you could include like Zach Tom can kick inside. They've got some practice squad guys on futures contracts. Sure, if you want to get technical. But the truth is, for guys that were on the roster last year, he's the only one that's a backup interior offensive lineman. So the Packers need more bodies there before they could even consider moving on from Newman. So here's two interior offensive linemen that could at least make some sense. Probably more on the starter side of things, or maybe even a rotation with Sean Ryan again. Standing in at six foot five, 312 pounds, we've got Dalton Rissner, the former Denver Bronco, former Minnesota Viking, has never had a pass blocking efficiency come in under 96.7 over his five year career. The former second round pick is also coming off a stint where he played every week from week six through the end of the season for Minnesota. His four years prior, durability was never a massive concern as he logged at least 830 snaps in every season. And while he's not the best in run blocking, he does offer a little bit of nasty that the Packers could use on the line. If the Packers don't intend to actually address the right guard position in the draft, which I think we're all in agreement they better, but if they don't, Rissner could be signed for relatively inexpensive considering even last year he played on a free agent contract of less than $3 million. So at the very least, if they were to put in Rissner and rotate him with Sean Ryan again, then you'd probably be looking at least being equal footing to how they were at that spot last year. Should they upgrade? Yeah, absolutely. But if they're looking for maintaining status quo, they could do worse than Rissner. Of note with Rissner, though, and I do want to make this clear, the question of availability or ability, I should say, ability versus opportunity is relevant here. He's played 4,518 snaps in his career. Every single one of them has taken place at the left guard spot. Could he switch to right? Has he ever been asked to switch to right? These are the things that we don't know at this time and certainly would need to be investigated by the Packers first. But if they feel as though he could present some type of versatility or they want to put him in a rotation with Sean Ryan because they just don't address it at a starter potential realm in the draft, Dalton Rissner could make some sense. Another option in the, well, if you're not going to draft him, you better do something category would happen to be center Brian Allen. Now, keep in mind, Okay. Even a lot of the interior offensive linemen that we've been looking at in the draft, someone like uh, Mason McCormick, etc. A lot of them haven't ever played center. And there's really no one on the team right now because they were experimenting with John Runyon Jr. there a bit. There's, there's a depth problem at center, no doubt about it. So regardless of what they do in the draft, signing someone who could be an actual backup center could make a lot of sense. And Allen has had a very interesting career filled with peaks and valleys. He's only 28 years old. And frankly, I'm not going to lie. His past has been pretty injury filled. Following their Super Bowl win, Allen signed a three-year extension worth $24 million. And it was well warranted. In 2021, that Super Bowl season, Allen started 16 of the Rams' 17 games and all four playoff games. He was named a Pro Bowl alternate and earned a PFF grade of 80.2 with a staggering 87.4 in the run blocking category. Now, Myers, in a lot of ways, has probably gotten a slightly worse reputation, and I'm also not doubting that Myers would still be the center. But to get an 87.4 run blocking grade would be a great change of place, pace on the Packers' offensive line. That was their Super Bowl year of 2021. He was only able to start five games in 2022 due to thumb and knee injuries. Then, prior to the 2023 season, he lost his job to his backup. And he played about 30 snaps this year as a backup. Allen is another player like Rissner where versatility is a question. Would they be signing Allen to be some, like, spread it out across the interior offensive line? He can do it all. Uh, they'd have to be sure he can play guard because thus far he's only played center. So he'd be affordable. He's got experience in an offense that's quite similar to the coming over from the Rams. 
Like I said, I don't think he'd supplant Myers, but as a pure backup center who maybe could be expanded upon to play more spots in the interior offensive line, going with someone who's had the peak that Allen has had would not at all be a bad idea. Moving on now to the other side of the ball, it's time to close some gaps. Let's take a look at linebacker first. And to say that Slim Pickens, it just doesn't do this market justice. Like, let's say that. Like, this linebacking market basically went on Ozempic, lost a bunch of weight, and then never looked back because there's just not a lot out here. I mentioned at the top that there was one position that I only have one guy for. And yeah, this position's got other names, okay? Uh, Deion Jones is out there, Isaiah Simmons, Shaq Leonard, sure. But none of them are great fits for, really, for Green Bay in a number of different ways. And realistically here, the Packers are looking for a starter. They've re-signed Eric Wilson. They still have Welch as backup inside linebackers. Some people out there still even think that McDuffie is due to be a backup linebacker this year, although I would tend to disagree. So what they really need is a guy who can start in their base 4-3 or perhaps even take some of those 4-2-5 snaps away. So just looking over the free agent market, I want to reiterate this, just how mighty hard it would be to come by a starting linebacker in free agency right now. Not a single free agent linebacker played over 62% of their team's defensive snaps last year. Only three even crossed over 50. So with that in mind, an option as a starting linebacker might just be Zach Cunningham earning a 69.4 overall grade from PFF last year and a 69.5 coverage grade, as well as a 70.7 rushing defense grade. Cunningham last played for the Philadelphia Eagles, where he played 717 snaps in their new 3-4 defense. And this is one thing of note. He's way more experienced being a 3-4 inside linebacker than he is being a 4-3 linebacker. Luckily, though, in a broad stroke here, their responsibilities are predominantly the same, and most of them... 3-4 inside linebackers, 4-3 off-ball linebackers, are able to translate their games fairly easily. So why he may be a fit is the Packers could really use some discipline in the run game. I think we can all agree on that. And that's one area where Cunningham, over the course of his career, has consistently performed. There's been only one season in his career where he's received a run defense grade under 70. And he's had peaks of 85.1 in 2021 and a ridiculous 89.2 in 2019. That would be the year I and I think a lot of other people tried to trade for him in all of our Madden franchises. It's not at all unreasonable to think that right now, if they were looking to sign a vet linebacker, that Cunningham would be a starter in base 4-3 over Eric Wilson. So he might make the most sense out of what's out there. With the draft not being the strongest linebacker class, I know there's some names out there that everybody wants. Edrin Cooper, obviously. Peyton Wilson, even some, let's say, later round guys, although some people are mocking him in round two now, like Wallace from Kentucky. And there certainly are others. But Cunningham may be that classic stopgap to not wanting to start a rookie if the board doesn't fall just the way they were looking for. And if they completely swing and miss at this position, which hopefully they don't, Cunningham may be the market they find themselves in. Now, taking a look at the secondary, the Packers have a rather glaring hole at safety, right? They've got one of the league's best safeties in Xavier McKinney. And then beyond that, they've got Anthony Johnson Jr. And they've got Benny Sapp and some other futures contracts. And Anthony Johnson Jr. and Benny Sapp, don't get me wrong, they're very nice developmental projects, but it probably is a far reach to say that either one of them should start at box safety next year. And we probably are being a little bit too deliberate lately in like saying McKinney is the guaranteed every down, every play, post safety, and then they need a guy that can mix it up in the box. Like McKinney's going to play in the box some, and the other guy probably would be expected to be a center fielder every so often. So Benny Sapp and Anthony Johnson Jr. could certainly fit well in that regard, but they are still developmental projects. 
And it should be noted as well that general manager Brian Goodekunst has said that they would love to have another younger guy with McKinney. So signing someone who's 34 years old or whatever kind of does go against what Brian Goodekunst was saying, although he's been known to uh, stretch the truth in interviews before. But still, signing a stopgap here, no matter what happens in the draft, may not be the worst move. So I have two options of varying likelihood. One, an unquestioned starter. Like you sign him, it's done deal. He's starting. One, maybe not unquestioned starter, but he certainly could, and he has before. But maybe you'd want him in more of a rotational style role with hopefully a high-end rookie that you're able to get. One would be very expensive. The other one, not so much. But both do present a certain level of versatility that they could be a great match for McKinney in the Packers' defensive backfield. So, player one, Justin Simmons, right? Like, I think we all knew I was going there. Well, it's not completely unrealistic, but I know. But it is April. He's still out there. It is possible. Yes, he's lost a step. He would take up the majority of the Packers' remaining cap room. But he's 30 years old. He's been on four All-Pro teams. And it's easy to believe that even after what could be considered a down year for him last year, that he still has several years of productive football left. As others have noted, he at this point may realistically be a better fit playing closer to the line, which is what the Packers need more of right now anyway. And that's fine, right? His 30 interceptions over seven seasons, that's what Green Bay could really, really use. Even sign him to a one-year deal, and the Packers may go from safety being a definite weakness to a bona fide strength. It also would allow the Packers to take more of a mid-round safety rather than having to prioritize it at the top of the draft because who knows what you're going to do if you don't get some top-tier rookie into play. Now, there are rumors that Justin Simmons is still requesting being paid like he's in the prime of his career. And if that's the case, then it probably isn't that realistic. And frankly, I don't really blame him. He's, you know, for all pro time. He's still got a lot of years left. This also, at age 30, could be his last chance at a multi-year contract or a larger payday. So, hey man, go ask for that money. But you want to play for a contender. You want to start for what should be a very fun and aggressive defense and still get paid. Yeah, I mean, he certainly could come on down to Green Bay. If they were to go sign him to some like multi-year deal with a lot of money, yeah, that would be harder to stomach. But at the very least, as a one-year stopgap, to bring in that type of playmaking into a secondary that truly has been lacking in that regard, it could be a boon for a team that's on the precipice of contending. Also, I should note, I didn't put Micah Hyde on this list, but you can take basically everything I just said about Justin Simmons. The, the being a step slower, the uh, not necessarily a perfect fit, but probably someone who at this point in their career should be playing a little bit closer to the line rather than being trusted as a true center. Copy and paste all of that to Micah Hyde, just to a lesser degree and a less expensive degree. And the last one, say it with me, Rudy, Rudy. Rudy, everyone else that I've mentioned has been an external free agent. And I'm not saying that signing Rudy Ford unequivocally fixes the safety position. But I said at the top, or I said at the beginning of this section, that one would be an unquestioned starter. The other one would be a little bit more rotational. And Rudy Ford, I believe, has earned himself a spot in the Packers safety room. He's 29 years old. He's coming off by far his best two career seasons, both of which just happened to be in Green Bay. Last year, when targeted, I feel like the stat gets forgotten a lot, but last year when targeted, he allowed only a QB rating of 30.1. That's a top five number in the entire NFL. Plus, over the last two years, he's amassed five interceptions and five pass breakups, while also adding 21 stops. He did all of that last year while having a missed tackle percentage under 10%. He was one of their best, if not the best, tackling secondary member for the Green Bay Packers. Pair that with his playmaking, and he was a flash of lightning in a secondary that was seemingly allergic to turnovers for most of the year. Plus, bear in mind, Ford was signed 
because he originally was considered a special teams ace, one of the best flyers in the NFL. And then he just wound up having to play safety out of necessity. So if they were to retain him, and if he were to start playing special teams a little bit more, rather than just having to be relied on as a safety, at the very worst, you're getting a guy who can heavily contribute on teams. That's, again, not a bad thing for the Packers to have as they continue to try to find the answer, try to find the solution to a special teams unit that, again, ranked in the bottom third of the NFL. So sign him, at the very least. You've got a special teams ace and a great backup post safety at an affordable price. Now, in summary, after talking about those guys, are there other free agents out there? Yeah, absolutely, unequivocally. Are there others that would still be a fit for Green Bay? Yes, but these were players that I felt like may be the best fits at each of their respective positions or guys that I just felt like were decent fits that just aren't being talked about enough. Keep in mind, too, of all the positions that I talked about, offensive tackle on the free agent market, pretty freaking thin. Guard, while being a lot deeper than tackle, has a lot more maybe older reclamation projects that you'd be hoping would recapture some former career glory at an affordable price. Linebacker, oh, I talked heavily about how like there, there's just nothing there. Safety of these positions is by far the deepest one out there. And there are other guys who do make some level of sense. So keep that in mind. I felt like the top two, the most obvious one, of course, for basically any team that needs a safety is Simmons. But Rudy Ford, I think, has played his way certainly into the conversation of helping out the safety position in Green Bay. So... That's all for today. Join me on Monday as I go over the Packers' thresholds for the draft. Talking position by position. Monday is going to be offense. Friday is going to be defense, unless there's some big news that wildly throws off the schedule for next week. But I'm going to go position by position, talk about who they've drafted before. What are they looking for in body types? What are they looking for just in terms of, uh, in terms of speed, agility, etc.? Going to be quoting Ron Wolf as well as a number of other very, very intelligent Packer people out there. So please do join me next week. In the meantime, though, have an absolutely fantastic weekend. And as always, go Pack Go.